All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this rainy night and welcome to everyone who's uh, online with us streaming. Uh, I'm Tim Ritchie. I'm the president of the museum and it's a real pleasure to welcome you tonight. Museums love rainy days, Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, but not rainy evenings because they're bad for attendance. But thank you to you for coming and thank you for everyone who's online. Um, I want to put this in context of uh, what we're trying to do at the Museum of Science in terms of current science and technology. We're trying to bring science to people at the pace of change. And we're creating five centers for public science learning. One is on data science and AI, and you'll hear about that tonight, but also one on the environment, on climate change, one on public health, one on tech and engineering, and one on earth and space. Because Science is amazing in its ability to help us solve the problems that we face, but it will require uh, an informed citizenry and a public that actually loves science and doesn't run away from it. Science has become so professional that a lot of times people can't see themselves in it. But in fact, if you have some agency in science and technology, the world really belongs to you. And that's what we stand. We're in the business of public science learning. And each word in that phrase is important public, that's all of it. Science, this breathtaking ability to solve problems and learning, which is really the key to the good life, actually. How can we work with optimism and joy for the problems that we face? I'd like to say thanks to the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation for sponsoring this event, and also to their sponsoring of the Exploring AI exhibit, and also all the others who helped us put that exhibit together, uh, which was the Toyota Research Institute, BNY Mellon, the Boston Foundation, Boston Dynamics, MathWorks, NASA, The Possible Zone, and the Computer Clubhouse. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's panel, Dr. Kara Miller, who is well-loved in this community and this institution and beyond. She's worked in radio and TV and print for the past 15 years, and currently writes a column on big ideas for the Boston Globe. From 2011 to 2021, she hosted and created the public radio program Innovation Hub, which won the 2021 Clarion Award for Radio. She holds a PhD from Tufts and a BA from Yale, and as I said, is a very good friend of the Museum of Science. So Kara, over to you. Thanks so much, Tim. And you know, thanks to the museum uh, for like making the space to have these kinds of conversations about what the future looks like, and they're complicated, and we've got great people here to talk about them. And thanks again to everybody here for coming out on a rainy night with the Royals in town, which makes traffic that much worse. And they're not usually in town, so. Um, uh, you know, about six months ago, we had a conversation here about AI that some of you might have been at, really talking about where AI is right now, sort of looking at what it's capable of. And now we want to take that sort of push the conversation to the next stage and think about um, how is AI going to affect our jobs, our kids' jobs? Should we be worried? What kinds of, re, you know, reskilling might be involved? Um, and we've got just a fantastically both smart panel, but also a panel that's really good at um, explaining the real life implications of how technology is changing. Um, before we start, I'm going to tell a little story that might inject a note of skepticism, or maybe not. Um, about five years ago, a little less, but just about five years ago, um, I sat down with the roboticist um, Rodney Brooks, who helped uh, found iRobot, and uh, which you may know um, created the Roomba. And um, at the time, you might remember, um, there were headlines, it was 2018, early 2018, just breathless headlines everywhere about self-driving cars. They were going to take over, they were like a year or two away, it was pretty clear. And in fact, not only were they going to change the way that we got around, but we, I might not need to own a car anymore because, you know, after the car dropped me off at the office, it could go pick somebody else up and, right? And so the nature of ownership itself could change. And I, so I talked to him and he was like, yeah, it's not going to happen. And he was like, I'd give it like 15, 20 years at least. But, but all these headlines were like, it's going to happen like in a year or two. And he said, but things are so much more complicated than we give them credit for. So at the time, he uh, lived in Cambridgeport, and he was like, 
all the time in Cambridgeport, I have to break the law to drive around. I have to drive the wrong way down a one-way street because there's construction and there's nothing, no other way I can do it. I have to pull over in places where you are not allowed to pull over. And he was like, how is a car that only knows how to follow the law going to drive around Cambridgeport? For those of you who live there, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and he said it gets more complicated. You know, it might be nice that a car can drive a kid home from soccer practice if they're all by themselves, but what if the kid gets in a car at a different time and asks the car to take them somewhere? What's the car going to do? What if the person who gets in is an adult, so they're fine, they, they're fine to be in a car, but what if they have Alzheimer's and they don't actually know where they should be going, but they think they do? A family member who's driving or even an Uber driver who's driving might pick up on a very complex set of social cues, but an AR, an AI car might not. And I, I guess a show of hands, did anybody come here in a self-driving car tonight? That was five years. No. Okay. So, so, you know, what I want to do tonight is sort of bring that same eye of skepticism, but realism to the question of AI. Like, what is um, AI really going to do to our jobs? Is it going to totally change them? Are we in for a revolution? Um, and so let me introduce our panelists, which I'll do with paper because this has gone off. Um, James Besson is the Executive Director of the Technology and Policy Research Initiative at Boston University. He also ran a software company and is the author of the book, The New Goliaths. Rana El Kaloubi is the Deputy CEO at SmartEye. She was a co-founder and CEO of Affectiva and the author of the book, Girl Decoded. She is also a general partner at AI Operators Fund and an executive fellow at Harvard Business School. Kareem Lakani is the Dorothy and Michael Hinsey Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He's the co-founder and chair of the Digital Data and Design D3 Institute at Harvard and co-author of Competing in the Age of AI. He also serves as an academic partner at Flagship Pioneering. <coughs> And a couple of housekeeping things just before we start. You may have seen the question that was up there, um, which is where have you seen AI before? And this is true for both people who are physically in the audience, but also who are watching online. Um, I encourage you to weigh in on that question. And then there's another question, which is, do you use AI in your job? And so we'd be interested to know if AI is something that comes up in your line of work. Um, and we're using Slido to take the questions. You can, um, you can uh, use the QR code. You can also go to slido.com and use the hashtag M-O-S-A-I-W-O-R-K um, to answer the questions. Um, let's jump right in. Ren, I want to ask you the first question. Um, you have been working with AI for a long time throughout school, for, in the professional world. Give me a sense of how things have changed in the time that you've been working on AI? Like, what does that trajectory look like? Okay, does this work? Yeah, it does. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, I actually joined as a trustee of the museum a few months ago, so it's extra special to, to be here tonight um, with all of you. Um, yeah, so my background is in computer vision and machine learning. I did my PhD at Cambridge University um, over 20 years ago. And, you know, back at the time when webcams were really big and slow and, and we didn't have smartphones, um, so the world did look very different. And um, I was in the business, to your point about self-driving cars, I was in the business of marrying cognitive intelligence and emotional intelligence in technology. So a lot of I, you know, a lot of technologies folk or when we build technology, we're very focused on the IQ of these devices, the cognitive intelligence, but nobody's really thinking about the social and emotional intelligence of machines. And so that's my area of expertise. And just over the last 20 years, there's been a ton of progress and we don't realize it, but AI is becoming mainstream and it is taking on roles that were traditionally done by humans. And so, you know, everything from helping you with your health and maybe hiring your next coworker or eventually driving your car. And I think that has a lot of implications on, yeah, on, on how we connect and communicate with these devices and what it means for us as humans in terms of how we connect with each other. So I, I've seen a lot of adoption of these technologies and a lot of promise, but also to your point, um, we ought to be 
skeptical sometimes. So do you want to talk, you talked about um, ways in which AI is now in our lives. Do you want to talk about a couple of specific ways where maybe a human once did something, but now it's AI doing it? Ooh, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of examples of that. Um, one of my favorites is actually a company that spun out of MIT. They're called Catalia Health, and they do a robot called Meibu. They're based on the West Coast. And Meibu is a robot that you send home with clinically um, ter terminally ill patients, um, super sick patients. And you can't really send a human nurse with these patients all the time. We can't, we, we, we just can't afford to do that. We don't have enough. You know, we don't have enough support staff that way. So you send the robot with the patient and the robot, um, you know, engages the patient, makes sure that, you know, they're sticking to their medications and also monitoring their baseline. So if they see signs of depression or anxiety, they can then escalate that to a human nurse. So that is a case where think of it as a partnership, right? It's not like it's not like we don't need nurses anymore. But we're definitely augmenting what nurses can do because now they can monitor and oversee a larger group of patients. Um, okay. Okay. So in some ways, it pushes the nurse up the chain, yes. and then you have like these robots working exactly. for it. Exactly. Kind of. Like robot minions working for yeah, the yeah. nurse kind of thing. Um, Kareem, I know you've advised a lot of companies um, on AI. Can you talk about this same kind of thing? How have you seen companies think about this and use AI? Um, in the time that you have been thinking and writing about this topic. Yeah, uh, of course, thanks for having me and to be here with people um, and all of you. Um, you know, I took a Uber or Uber to get here, uh, but I didn't have to call a taxi service. So like when I moved to Cambridge in 1997, if you remember to call a yellow cab or whatever, and like some cranky person would be there that would yell at you and scream at you, and maybe an hour later a cab might show up or not. Um, uh, and so that job is pretty much gone. I mean, there's still taxi dispatchers and limo dispatchers, but that whole function is gone because that now it's all done through the machine. And to even think that you would feel comfortable getting into a stranger's car to take you from point A to point B, like it seems like normal now, but like a decade ago, it was still weird, right? And now, but that's all been enabled through technology. Or also today, if you have Spotify, you have the Spotify wrapped. Right, uh, so that's a, like a replacement story, right? Like the the dispatchers are gone. Now it's all done through machines. Spotify Wrapped is interesting because Spotify has about two hundred million subscribers, uh, and they give you a summary of all the music you've listened to and some insights about your listening habits. Uh, so I put that up on my Twitter uh, today, uh, actually this evening, and to think about the fact that they can now create custom messages for two hundred million people. Right, telling you what you've listened to and what your favorite artists are, and what does it tell you about you, and how it connects to your friends, is again something that humans could never do. We could never put enough people on that job. So there is a whole new set of capabilities that I think we are sort of taking for granted in our personal lives through our mobile phones that are all driven by AI. And then we sort of see sort of deployment. Of, uh, of AI, like in dentistry, you, you start to see the deployment of AI um, in, uh, in industrial settings where it's helping operators figure out what's wrong with a, with a part. And that's a whole augmentation story. So we see replacement, uh, we see augmentation, and we see a whole new set of tasks being invented because the machines can do things at scale that humans just can't. Um, you have uh, said something to me before, which I've quoted to a lot of people, which is every company is an AI company. Uh, some companies know it, some companies don't. And then there are some CEOs who are like, oh man, I see this, but do I want to see this? Um, is that still the case? Do you still feel like there's a lot of resistance? Oh yeah. I mean, I, th yeah. I think the, the, you know, being at the business school and t talking about technology, you're sort of already seeing weird, like this should be about finance and accounting and and marketing, but what we're seeing is that across the enterprise of any kind of organization, whether it be for profit or nonprofit, is the the ways the work is being done and the ways in which we're using data is now being changed. And some companies get the memo, understand it, and are rapidly adapting. And a bunch of people are like, I don't want to think about it. Like I, I just want I just want it to go away. And I would say majority are still in the latter category. Because they just don't, they can't imagine a world set up this way. Because in many ways, again, if you sort of think about Spotify as a company, like it's not a record company, 
it's not a radio station, right? But it doesn't have that many people working and serving 200 million people. Like my favorite example is out of China, Ant Group, which is their financial services app. They have a billion, 1.2 billion users and only 15,000 employees. That's a very different type of a company than what I did when I started my career at General Electric in the last century. So I think, I think the shape of companies is changing. Um, and I think uh, we have a generation of leaders starting at the boards and in the C-suite that just have not engaged in technology. Technology was always like some in the basement and not the problem, uh, not the problem they worried about. Uh, and now it's like becoming the core way in which you get anything done. Um, Jim, you've written about software that's used within big companies um, that in some cases is getting so good that it allows them to fend off smaller companies. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and why that is? Why would this software be so helpful? Right, so thanks for having me here. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about an example of a technology. The, in the 70s, um, the barcode scanner was introduced into retail and this turned out to be a great boon to small retailers. They could scan items, they didn't have to change prices price tags on all the items, they could scan them at the, the register, it was faster, it saved time. It, 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 was a, it was an equalizing technology because the smallest players could afford it, it allowed them to do some things that the biggest players were already doing. We're now seeing that technology has been morphed. Walmart was the one who excelled at taking the barcode scanners at every cash register and every store in their network, tying them all together in a satellite network uh, allowing the data to be accessed by store managers, by central headquarters, and even by suppliers, and creating a new kind of organization uh, so that they could very quickly detect when they were going to stock out of one item, very quickly detect which items were selling quickly so they could get more of it to the store, detect differences between one neighborhood and the next and what they were buying, and this allowed them to become much more efficient so they could lower prices, and it made them a ruthless competitor. Um, and so they grew from 3% of the market share of general merchandise uh, retailers to over half in, in, in a period of 30 years. No one's going to disturb Walmart anytime soon because they've got, it's not just the software, and it's not just the, the AI or the computers or the satellite networks, it's the entire organization is built around this. And this is, this is what Kareem was talking about, I think, that this is an organization that's built, in, integrated the people and the technology in a way that makes it very difficult for smaller competitors, even competitors like Kmart and Sears, to compete with. You've also talked about how um, we've seen the rise of mass customization, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, like something that's for the masses is not customized, um, but talk about what that is and why it's important in this whole discussion. Yeah, so I, I'm fascinated by economic history. And so the, if you look at the, the history in the 19th century, the big change was mass production. Uh, they could produce things cheaply in great quantities. They could produce steel cheaply and, and the price of steel dropped. They could produce automobiles cheap. Henry Ford and his assembly line, uh, uh, you know, made the car automobile affordable to and the, the average person. Um, but that was mass production could only be achieved with standardization. H Henry Ford famously said, "You can have any color car you want as long as it's black." Um, obviously, cars have introduced. I think Tesla is that way still. I think are you going to get black or white? <laughs> um, but you know what that meant was that you were meeting the, the sort of the lowest common denominator of everybody's needs in a very effective, efficient way, low cost, but it meant that lots of specific needs didn't get met. And so when you think about what Walmart's done, it's, it's, it's tailored things so that the needs of every store yeah, and it, it change you know, rapidly. Um, and so that they're tailoring uh, what they're doing to the particular marketplace and, and achieving a much, um, you know, um, um, a much better way of meeting consumer needs. But it's not just retailers, it's manufacturers. So automobiles these days are largely software vehicles. There, you know, there may be a hundred million lines of code in a, in, a, in a car, and it allows the manufacturers to tweak all sorts of things, to tailor models, to produce different models, uh, 
It's true of airplanes. It's true of financial services where, you know, the credit card companies have a great amount of data on our transactions and they're able to tailor credit offers that are, you know, sort of matched to our needs and perhaps our proclivities, our, you know, our risk, our taste for risk or our willingness to maybe pay too much. Um, and they're able to market it very well. You have, you know, Google and Facebook are doing targeted advertising. Everything is being just much more tailored to the individual uh, needs and, and wants. I remember once talking to somebody who talked about the um, how credit card companies could put together a bunch of data points and predict um, who was likely to get divorced. Now, they don't really care who's likely to get divorced, except that if you're about to split your assets in half, they might care. Um, and it was the the data points now, this a few years ago, so it might have changed, but I thought it was just totally fascinating. It was like, not anything individually, but it was like teeth whitening plus hotels in your own city, <laughs> plus like joining a gym or something. And those things strung together, like really, it, I guess, increased your likelihood that you're getting divorced. Um, I think we have a slide on the screen um, that we're going to put up. And Cream, this is from your book. And actually, it's funny that Jim talked about uh, Walmart because here's Walmart's I don't want to say successor, but competitor, yes. Amazon. Talk a little bit about this and how you would say it's connected to um, like the AI factory that Jeff Bezos built. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is a great chart because there, there are a few things going on here. First is like it says stock chart and, you know, I don't have the 2022, but, you know, they're still up there even though there's been a cr crash of the market. Um, but what you see is Amazon moving beyond books, basically 1999. And then you see them adding a whole bunch of marketplace things, so it became an everything store. Uh, but then you see this uh, this story about AI investments begin, and this is where they said, we've got so much data on all these consumers and all of these merchants, we don't know what to do with it, and let's go and make sense, sense of it. So you start to see this AI investments basically start around 2007 and so. And what's interesting is, you know, like, I ask people like how many, uh, you know, there's a term called SKUs, like stock keeping units. How many units are in a typical Amazon store? And people say, well, maybe 5 million, 20 million, 30 million. The real number is 600 million. There are 600 million items, individual items that they sell on amazon.com. 600 million. Like, we can't manage that on a spreadsheet, right? We don't have enough rows, <laughs> right? And there aren't enough product managers to, or retail managers to manage that. Right? you basically start to sort of see that these AI investments basically came about because they realized that they just could not keep up with the volume of data that they were accumulating. In most organizations, the data flows through and disappears. They said, oh, we can now actually start to do something. So their AWS, their cloud services were also happening. But then this is like their, their massive uptake. So, so, so that's one story. And then underneath is what you see is these, these, these terms like Obidos, Garupa, Santana, this is Amazon rebuilding its technology infrastructure three times over. So again, most organizations say, oh, I've got my system, I got SAP, it took me five years to get it done, and then that's done. But when you, and this is a, the future we see, like companies will have to keep running software, building new software systems and adapting, because in many ways, there's nothing that happens in modern organizations without software, right? If you sort of think about your jobs, Nothing happens without software. Now, the software could be really crappy, right? And it's like full of bugs and it breaks and like it's terrible, but it's all happening in software, right? Like we're not, besides healthcare, we're not faxing things around, right? And so, and so the point is what you see at Amazon is a real transformation from just a bookstore to this platform company that, you know, kind of is like Walmart, but in this new, new side, but they're not just doing books, they're doing music, they have AWS. They're going to have a pretty big play in healthcare. It's pretty obvious that that's going to happen. And guess what? You know, um, about two thirds of American households have uh, Amazon Prime accounts. Two thirds, right? That's more people than go to church on Sunday, right? And so if you have all this data, you can now start to imagine what else I could, I know about Kara and what else can I do and start to build systems to enable this to happen. Go ahead. Well, I was going to build on that. And and they also have Amazon Alexa in the house. And then they just bought iRobot. So they're going to be, ha you know, they have the data from the Roombas. So if you imagine 
combining all of that data and using it to predict and personalize all sorts of, yeah, things related to our life. I actually was going to ask you, so, you know, Jim's talked about the behemoth that is Walmart and Kareem talked about the behemoth that is Amazon. And I'm sure they are uh, engaged in a really um, sort of vicious tech war themselves. Um, but as somebody who has started a small company, um, do you worry that uh, these really big guys are so well resourced and building walls so high that it's hard to, you know what I mean? That they keep all the um, new, fresh, exciting players out. Um, I think I think that is definitely a consideration in some application areas, but not in all of it. I think what is what is truly differentiating is the data, and they have amazing data, like gobs and gobs of data. But it but but it's not generalizable, right? Like, so in our specific example, we have the largest, world's largest emotion repository of people responding to content. You know, we have facial expressions and facial videos, um, and, and we can leverage that to understand people's emotional experiences. Um, you know, if, if, if Netflix decided to do this at some point, they can definitely compete with us, you know, from a data standpoint. Um, but I also think these big companies always make decisions about building the technology themselves or partnering and buying. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't see that as a, as a big barrier, I guess, for startups. So and you're, you're investing in startups. Yes. Yes. AI I should startups. mention that too. Yes. Um, so in the last year, post selling my company, I started a fund, um, AI operators fund. We invest in pre-seed um, AI focused and AI driven companies. A lot of the things that are in Kareem's book are kind of criteria we use to um, evaluate these companies. We've met, we've made 10 investments so far. Half of them are in the health and wellness space. So digital biomarkers and how can we use all of the data we know about you know, each of us to um, make better health and wellness recommendations. So that's an area I'm very excited about. The, um, to, to put a slightly more pessimistic cast on it, <laughs> a lot of the data is showing that uh, startup firms are growing more slowly. Tech firms, productive firms are, are growing more slowly over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, they have a harder battle to fight. Doesn't mean that they can't win, but it's a they have to pick their targets and what they're doing Agreed. much more carefully, I think, than uh, startup firms had to do 20 years ago. And it turns out that the slowdown in the growth of productive companies affects the entire economy. It's one of the key reasons why aggregate productivity, something you read about in the, you know, the business section of the newspaper, is, isn't growing as fast as it used to. And that means, in a sense, that the, the economic pie, the GDP, isn't growing as fast uh, as it used to. And, and so it's it's directly related to these interactions between large companies and uh, innovative small companies. Jim, this has been happening like, in, over history. Like you as a historian, no, like every era, like oil companies, auto companies, you know, IBM, and then Microsoft and the PC software industry. Like you know, like you you sort of saw these monopolies emerge, and that does slow down sort of in that sector some some activity. But then entrepreneurs figure out some other places to go. So I'm just trying to reconcile how much of that from your point of view is coming from is it new just because of ai and digital or is it that this history repeating itself, rhyming itself over and over again yeah the good the, uh, good point um i think if you go back and look at the 19th century yeah nobody was going to compete with john d rockefeller in petroleum refining but the you know the overall economy in terms of innovation and startups uh, was was very healthy then yeah it's, it's, you know, and you can look through most of the 20th century and, you know, in, in specific industries, one after the other, you would see effects and, and the small guys got, you know, you look at automobiles, there yes. were, were hundreds of initial automobile suppliers and now there are three or four or five. Yeah. Um, what's happened in the last 20 years, though, seems to be different. Mm. That there's a real uh, separation and it does seem, you know, it seems to be related to uh, this, this, imbalance between the, these large companies who yes. have these very extensive systems, they have them well integrated into large organizations, and that makes it difficult for uh, smaller companies to compete unless they can somehow step aside. And, yeah. And, yeah. and, it, and it, it, you know, in the aggregate numbers, it's, it's, it's looking like that's becoming a serious problem. Now, it may get resolved, but that's what we're seeing. 
and and it, and it is so th this is sort of one of the downsides i think of ai and uh software technologies yeah. Let's talk a little bit about jobs, and I should say that Slido, which you used before, you can also use, whether you're here physically or uh, watching online, um, to submit your own questions at, that occur to you as we talk. Um, Rana, you and I have talked before about um, your concern that there's sort of a division between people who have access to AI and understanding it and people who don't. Can you just talk about what your concern is? Yeah, I mean, one of them is is what... Jim was talking about, right? Like we start seeing this divide between companies that have companies, organizations, governments that have the data and, and, you know, those that do not, right? So I'm very concerned about that. I grew up around, you know, I'm originally from Egypt. I grew up around the Middle East and I, I am concerned that this divide, you know, this economic divide is going to grow more and more because, yeah, because some, some, countries and organizations don't have access to this type of data and 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 that's an issue so um i think that's something that we really need to think hard about um the good news is the barrier to entry is is low is low right and and um you know it's easy to get it's potentially easy to get access to data um so hopefully we'll see kind of grassroots startups and and ecosystems get created to bridge the gap um Jim, kind of building on that, you've talked about a, uh, a sort of polarization in jobs or access to jobs. And um, you have a, a quote um, in your book, only select workers have access to the new technology to learn the skills that bring high pay. I know you've thought a lot about learning and work. What's happening? What's happening that's different? Yeah. So, I mean, the division isn't just between countries. It's, right. it's even within the U.S. Right. right. True. Seeing we're seeing some companies will, you know, advertise a job which has certain characteristics, and they will pay substantially more than other companies off, you know, advertising the same the same job. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> um, so what's different is that you you've got to you've got to learn through experience. That and so when you only have select companies that have the data and the systems and the organizations, there's only select places you can learn. And so this this is starting to you know, your, your pay increasingly depends not just on what your education is and what your talents are, but also on whom you work for, which seems a little, a little nuts. Um, we've seen evidence that the, the, the economists have done a, did a real neat paper where they showed that software engineers were willing to take a pay cut to work at a company where they could have access to the latest technology. They recoup that later on because when they left, they got a, a better, higher paying job. But, you know, there, it's a real bottleneck in, in, in terms of, of skills. And, and so we have this whole new technology. We don't know how to create all the skills for the people who need. I mean, that, and that becomes a barrier to startups because they have a harder, much harder time hiring because they've got to compete with, you know, Google or Microsoft. And, uh, it, it, it becomes, you know, much more polarized. So we need in some ways to open open it up and make the, the technology more accessible just so people can learn about it. And Jim, you know, if, if you believe the hypothesis that every company is a software company or is going to become, a, or has going to have AI at the core, then the demand for talent is then economy-wide. Like before, if you were in healthcare, then you just stayed in healthcare, right? And if you were in travel business, you just, you were, you would be in the travel business, right? And so on and so forth. But now the needs for these folks are economy wide. So then the healthcare companies, the pharma companies are competing against Google for the same talent, right? Which they were not used to thinking about before. And that's also creating a ton of friction, right? Because the skills are, are still not widely spread. The experiences are not widely spread. And then we all want the same people. And, and it, the same is true within the firm, so that it's not, things were much more siloed before. If you were at Walmart, the only people who needed to deal with the cash register data in the old style of retailing were the buyers. Yes. Now, now it's lots of people have to deal with computer systems and understand the markets. And, and you know, so there, there's a need for hybrid skills, which combine marketing knowledge and specific market knowledge and te technical skills as well. So these are new kinds of skills, new hybrid skills, and they affect a, a wide range of occupations uh, within the firm. So let's look into the future a little bit. Um, Kareem, can you talk about how you think AI is going to change the mix of jobs out there right now? 
Um, I, I, so I'm not a labor economist, so you know, this, these are all speculations. I mean, I think, I think the, the way I think about this is, like, again, like there's, there's going to be replacement, there's going to be augmentation, and there's going to be new things. Uh, and I think you can start to imagine this. So one of the companies that one of my students started, and I'm on the board of, Video Health, uh, just announced a big deal with uh, a dental, dental software company to enable AI for dentists. It turns out that dentists are terrible at reading x-rays. And we've done some studies that's shown that uh, the false negative rate, so not detecting cavities, is like 50%. So like half of you have stuff going on in your mouth because your dentist was not properly trained in, in x-rays and you know, it isn't working in a setting where there's lots of other dentists around that they can look at an image, which is what happens in radiology. So now there's like this dental AI company and they're gonna basically bring superpowers to dentists. And so that's gonna hopefully be good for healthcare and good for outcomes for patients. But it's gonna augment the dentist's job in an interesting way. Um, I, think, I think the thing that is, is for me, the bleeding edge is like all the new stuff that is emerging. So like, again, we talked a little bit about Dolly and sort of this massive generation, the, this, these generative AI models that are doing, or and large language models that are doing stuff that people just didn't imagine were possible. So if you go to a Dolly or, you know, Midjourney or a, a Stability AI, you can basically speak something, say something, and it'll create an image for you. And the quality keeps getting better and better and better, which is like, as I look at that, I go, oh, how will marketing change if I can now have a particular image targeted for Rana and for Jim at basically zero marginal cost, right? So that's, that's like, like the whole marketing chain changes radically if you do that and pricing and so on and so forth as well. And so let me give you a couple more thoughts on this and then, then we can talk about it. And so, so, so there's... That, that is happening. The same thing is happening with like large language models. And so, you know, 30 to 40% of code now being generated on GitHub is being done by computers, by, by AI, right? And so we have a saying in software that the difference between an average programmer and a good programmer is 10x. Well, maybe now with the help of AI, you could in fact, you know, change that distribution, which would be kind of interesting. Like software is such a hard thing and maybe AI will just generate that for us. So that's interesting. Even like, do you still want to be a computer scientist the way I was, right? Like, exactly. I was I mean, trained, what is right? computer scientist right. will change? And so we had this discussion at Harvard because now the GPT, whatever, three, four, whatever is out there now, you can actually give it a prompt and it'll write a full essay for you. So like, I'm like, okay, I'm waiting for the time when my students start submitting Right. Or they already are. Or oh, they already are. Yeah. <laughs> and we won't know how to detect it because each one is different and all that kind of stuff, right? So, like, we're going to be in this arms race. But I think there's a, something also very interesting on, on this augmentation story, which I think is, like, TBD. We'll figure this out. Um, I have a postdoc working with me, uh, uh, Fabrizio Delacqua, and his PhD thesis uh, was looking at what happens when experts start relying on AI. And do they get better or do they get worse? And so he randomly allocated different quality of AI uh, tools to recruiters who are recruiting people for, for jobs. And what he discovered is this asleep at the switch, this asleep at the wheel story, that if you gave people good AI, they stopped doing critical thinking. And so they had worse outcomes in selecting candidates for the jobs versus those that had okay AI that could help them filter, but you had to apply your critical thinking. And I think that has huge implications if this is generalizable across different occupations, because if now all of a sudden I've got this tool and I don't have to think as much, then am I just going to get sloppy as well, right? And so I think that, and Tesla auto drive is the same story as well. Uh, our backup speaker uh, mentioned this to us. Uh, and so, and so, uh, uh, so the, that is like super interesting. And I think we're going to see that emerge. And I think that's, I think the edge, like new types of occupations are being created, but the augmentation story is going to be, it's going to be super cool. Rana, can you talk a little bit about jobs you see happening? And if we go forward a couple of slides, we have a picture of an old assembly line that we can show you, which I think is very interesting. Um, there it is, yep. working on some cars. And you can see it's like almost shoulder to shoulder people working. There's a lot of cars, but there's even more people. Um, and then we have a more recent uh, car factory with yep. no people. I mean, I assume there's like a manager somewhere, a couple IT people and something, but um, what are places? No, we don't have fifty percent unemployment, so it's not like those people couldn't find another job necessarily. Um, but um, give me a sense of how you know places where you think things are going to really change. 
Yeah, I think there are actually, um, so I, I spun my company out of MIT and we were building Emotion AI. And basically what we built was this, um, it's like it's like it's like this pipeline, right? This factory AI factory, which starts with data collection, data acquisition, data warehousing, data annotation, and then you use that data to train and validate the algorithms, and then you kind of rinse and repeat. Like you're always improving the algorithm and and allowing it to learn over time. And that whole pipeline basically presents us with new opportunities for new jobs. So data acquisition specialists and data you know, data engineers and data annotators, right? Like we have a whole team in Cairo, like a hundred people in Cairo, Egypt, their sole job is to annotate data. They watch all these videos and they identify where are the smile expressions and the surprise expressions. Um, and they so have the to new trained. job descriptions that nobody would have recognized right. 10 years ago. Exactly. These are all new job opportunities, even with these robots, right? Like, um, we need humans to, um, almost like not babysit the robots, but ensure that these robots are behaving in the right way. And um, so I, I do recognize that obviously a lot of jobs are going away, but, but there's um, a new class of jobs that are being created, which are very exciting. And, and they, they're not all technical, which I think is the most amazing thing. You don't have to be a software engineer or a computer scientist or a machine learning scientist to access this world. Again, like our data annotators just need to be really meticulous and patient because they're, you know, watching a lot of videos and, and annotating them, labeling them. So, um, Jim, you write about um, a well-covered event in 2016 when um, the computer scientist Jeffrey Hinton said radiology, people can just, should stop training in radiology because we're not going to need radiologists um, in five years, I think. So it's been six years, there are no radiologists. No, there are radiologists. So what happened there? I mean, we, we in fact have a shortage of radiologists. Yes, that's And right. this is despite offshoring a lot of radiology to India. So it's, it's, it's this story that Rodney Brooks was talking about. It's just a lot more complicated. Mm. It takes a whole lot long. Mm. Um, it, they did a study uh, last year. Uh, the, uh, there were over 2,000 uh, AI projects that published papers that talked about uh, identifying COVID in x-rays. And so they, there was a review of these papers and they found that not one of them was clinically applicable. In other words, it, it wasn't good enough and it wasn't suitable for a, a, a real clinical environment uh, where doctors would, you know, would need it. And plus the fact that just identifying what's on the x-ray is only part of the problem and is only part of the information that goes into it. Um, if you look historically, there have always been fears about automation, and the thing about it is it tends to occur much, much more slowly. So, uh, again, economic history, the, over the course of the 19th century, they started with one loom per weaver, and automation enabled, uh, allowed it to happen so that the mills were filled to, to a point where each weaver would have uh, 24 looms. Uh, it was not quite as sparse as that robot factory, but pretty sparse. Um, yet the number of weavers grew over that entire period. Why? Because the automation also lowered the prices, which created greater demand, and so they opened up many, many more mills and hired more, uh, more weavers. Or, you know, the automated teller machine was going to eliminate bank tellers. They brought them in, and what happened? We actually had more bank tellers. Why? Because it made it cheaper for banks to open new offices, you may have noticed they've opened offices all over the day. All over Harvard Square. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're now coffee shops, too. Yeah. You can't even tell what's a bank office, really. <laughs> and, but it, it meant that the number of bank tellers actually went up. Eventually, we may not have bank tellers. I, I see that point. But it's, it's taking a, you know, a much longer period of time. And it, you know, a much, it's both that the technology has to adapt, and the economics is more complicated than people, people realize. So we've gotten a bunch of questions from in here, from online. Let me ask a few of them. I'll, I'll go right for the hard one. Um, I mentioned uh, autonomous vehicles, the person says. How worried should people like truck drivers be about their jobs going away? I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that. I mean, I, one of the main use cases of our technology is in the automotive industry, and uh, we do driver monitoring and interior sensing solutions so we can understand what's happening inside a car. Um, again, I think it's going to take a lot longer um, than, than 
than we initially anticipated, I guess. But even then, I think there's going to be a role for, for fleet drivers and truck drivers because they can become the operators, like they can become kind of the monitors. And instead of driving one fleet or overseeing one fleet, you can have many, many trucks that you are overseeing remotely kind of thing. So um, I think it will require reskilling, but I don't think the job completely goes away in the foreseeable future. I also suspect there's some period of adjustment, as everybody has talked about. I mean, one of the, back to the Rodney Brooks conversation, one of the things he said is that even though there are something like 30 or 35,000 deaths uh, from automobile crashes every year in the U.S., when there is a crash involving an autonomous vehicle, it gets maybe a thousand times the attention of a crash involving two vehicles where people were driving. And so people's impression is that there's all these autonomous vehicles crashing, but in fact, that it's really the opposite. It's just that those things are so common, unfortunately, they don't get very much attention. So it also may take time. No, and I think this is like a really good point. If you generalize this, you know, do we expect, when, when do you expect our machines to be better than humans? equivalent to humans or worse than humans and under what circumstances would you take machines that are worse than humans equivalent to humans versus better than humans right and so we have this and i always like tell my students you know like you gotta think counterfactually like okay like like for example again like dentists that's like a you know false negative rate of you know 50 percent like surely we can solve that problem right if you want to rely on machines to help you solve that in lung cancer diagnosis, the false positive rate in a NIH trial with 250,000, a $250 million trial with 50,000 patients, the false positive rate for radiologists for detecting lung cancer is 98%. 98%, which is, and, and, so, and now of course, why? Because you know, like lung cancer is a bad disease. If you see something, you wanna bring the patient in, but sure, and just think about the cost, right? Now that you've said you've got lung cancer, we gotta set you an appointment. You gotta get to the uh, to the hospital. We gotta put a needle in your lung. We gotta aspirate it. We're gonna send it to pathology. We're gonna evaluate that, right? And ninety percent of the time, it's like, oh, sorry, you're fine. Good news, right? But 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 surely we can add technology to help. And I think this is where it's getting interesting. Is that we have to start thinking about the counterfactual example, like how good are the humans really? Like we sort of privilege humans to be like, like I don't, you know, like I asked this question in my in my class, like how many are good drivers in my class? And everybody raises their hands. And I go, I didn't know Harvard Business School was selecting for good drivers, right? But but we over, we're overconfident in our abilities and. Then you've got to say like, okay, how good are the humans really? And then should we bring the machine in? And I think in a business situation, we can do the cost benefit analysis, but in society, we have a hard time saying like all the autonomous cars need to be perfect because you know, we can't have an accident by autonomous vehicle and makes headlines when humans are terrible drivers, right? Uh, and, and so, so that's, I think, I think a really important consideration both in businesses, but in society as well, say what role these machines have as our companions and as people that, as people, like as, as I don't even really know what to call them anymore, as, as things that will be working with us. Uh, by the way, um, about 82% of you said that you use AI in your uh, daily work, which actually shocked me. We do have a smarter um, audience. Select for smart people, finish. yes. <laughs> Talking before about how people will not realize how much AI underpins their work, but again, smarter than average, so, so you do. Um, we, um, as I ask the last few questions here, I want to um, ask you if you uh, go to Slido um, to uh, put in, if you have an ethical concern, it can be just like a word or two, like warfare or something regarding AI. I'd love to see what the concerns are from the audience. Um, let me ask one question I thought was really interesting, which is because of AI, anybody can answer this. Do you think that freelancing or people sort of dissociated from an organization will become, will that become something that happens more? I mean, certainly we've talked about the rise of the gig economy. I don't know if that's where you see that headed. That's a good question. And I think it can go both ways. Uh, on, you know, on the one hand, you're seeing, uh, you know, better and better tools that can augment a freelance, provide you know, provide a freelancer abilities that they would not have except in a large organization. On the other hand, where we're seeing the AI 
and sophisticated software technologies employed, it tends to be in these large organizations that are building, you know, where you're working as part of a, of a very big system. Um, so I, I think it's pulling in both directions and it's gonna be very interesting how it plays out. One of the areas that I think is really fascinating is this, the whole kind of virtual human economy, like the digital twin. And I mean, obviously a lot of these virtual humans are AI generated and AI powered. Um, so imagine, for example, if I had a digital twin and I could send my twin all over the world to do keynotes and speak while I'm, you know, hanging out on some beach. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that is very interesting and we have to kind of consider what does that do to the free, you know, the definition, what is the definition of a freelancer, right? right. Because um, I think there will be very interesting and new ways by which you can, yeah, you can kind of be revenue generating. Well, and also what's the jet? definition of you like it would people who want to hear you speak be be okay with your digital twin i don't know right? they would i don't know would they know like i mean i don't know right <laughs> like eventually i don't yeah yeah um another question are there regional or cultural differences that you can think of that might make it harder for ai to penetrate certain spheres if anybody has any thoughts well, well i think i think in europe there is a real uh uh conversation about data and data protections, much more so than in the US and you know, China is an outlier on its own. Um, I, th I do think that it's kind of misguided. And I think, I think the problem is that people say they care about data privacy kind of like the same way as like, I'm gonna try to stay off carbs. You know, like, I, you know, it's like, it's really hard, right? And so the, you know, I, I'm a, a board member for Mozilla Corporation. We make Firefox browsers, like the nice organic browser that you should all be using. You probably used it before, but now you're using Chrome. And if you're using Chrome, you're giving all your data to Google. You are. And so a lot of people say, oh, I care about data privacy. Using Chrome, we, and guess what? The market share for Chrome in Europe is like 70%. All right, and so, so while there's all this conversation about data and data privacy, uh, one of my colleagues, Leslie John, has shown that privacy as a good is really hard for humans to actually understand and deal with. And so we all, want health and we want to all, all be lean and, and eat better, but most of us don't. And I think the, the same stories on my, my view is that, you know, we're like on data is the same things. Now, the EU is adding a whole bunch of regulations, which is, is also, by the way, uh, curtailing startup innovation uh, and actually emboldening the, the monopolies, uh, American monopolies in Europe because of those regulations. Um, and so, so we're seeing sort of like, people trying to make sense of it, but I, I, think, I think Europe is headed the wrong way from my perspective on the data side. But even in the US, we don't have good, a good sense of what that looks like. And I think part of it is that as societies, we don't know what to think about this. Like I love the convenience of Google and Gmail and all that stuff being built in so that it can now like, complete my sentences for me, right? It has my affect showing up in my, in my Gmail. It, it reads all my emails and then tells me if I'm running late for my meetings. So I like all that, right? But there is a price that I'm paying in terms of them having access to all my data. And so lots of us are sort of in, gonna be in this dilemma of convenience, right? Versus sort of our beliefs about privacy. And I think that's gonna have, have an effect on companies and citizens and so on and so forth. Google and carbs. We, if you've used Google today, there are cookies at the back of the room after. There we go. <laughs> exactly. Don't, don't, don't send me there, please. I'll just have the cheese. This is the fat. I forgot. It's okay. We can always come back to it. Let's, uh, building on that, let's talk a little bit about the ethical concerns. And I'm just going to mention a few things that people um, put down, and then you can kind of, you know, work off of that. Um, Bias in hiring. These are, these are things people are concerned with. Bias in hiring, um, uh, data being used with no legislation to stop it, um, weaponization. A bunch of people said privacy, equality, um, commodification and selling of our activities and needs, inequitable access or impacts. I feel like a couple of big sort of pots of things uh, come out of that, like the inequality and the and differences in access and then a lot of data privacy. Feel free to jump in there when you hear that. And and if you if you agree, if that's your concern too, or you don't, like that's not where you are. Yeah, so it, I, I mean, clearly some of these are major concerns. I think it's also pretty clear we have to, we, we haven't figured out really what's going on and what, you know, what what the real harms are going to be. 
I, I mean, there's some areas like weapons, I think we can, you know, pretty clearly identify what's going on, but uh, privacy is much more elusive. But some of the other things like on inequality or unfairness, um, there are a number of attempts to, to deal with that. I, one of the encouraging things is we're, we did a survey of software startups uh, on their, uh, to what extent they uh, employed AI ethical principles. And it turns out that I think it was 58% of them responded that you did. And, and these were not just window dressing. In other words, it's not just PR, but they actually took action to make sure that they were operating in a more ethical way. They, they fired people or they withdrew from some certain lines of business. Um, and so it, it, I find it, I, you know, I, th I think where we're at is going to, we're the beginning of a learning process where these uh, technologies are going to have uh, major effects. We can identify some of them. Uh, I talked about the, you know, the impacts of, of large firms and what, what that's doing, but, but there are others that are going to come up. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on, on, on fairness. But what's uh, encouraging is that the, the, in, the developers themselves, to, to a great degree, are, are very well aware of some of these things and are at least taking some steps, uh, some real steps to, uh, to do something about it. Other ethical concerns? Yeah, I, I like to think of it in two buckets, the ethical development and the ethical deployment of AI. So on the development side, I think the biggest problem today by far is data and algorithmic bias. In, in my space where we like analyze people's faces and facial expressions, um, over the last two years we've seen um, the big tech companies basically release facial recognition technologies that would not, that were trained primarily on middle-aged white men. And so if it saw a face like mine, it wouldn't even recognize the face, which is a big problem, obviously. And so, yeah, and, and so the, the diversity of the data is really important to avoid bias in the algorithm. And the only way you avoid diversity in the data is if you have a diverse team around the table designing these technologies. So I'm a big, big proponent of, um, yeah, ensuring you've got these diverse perspectives when we're when we're building um, AI. The other is the deployment of it. And um, again, in, 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 my, in my particular space, one of the applications of emotion AI is in security and surveillance and lie detection. And we've been routinely approached by the US government and other governments to deploy the technology in this way. But I just think it's, um, you know, we're, we're opening the door for discrimination and profiling. And I just think the technology is not there. Uh, there's no regulation around how you use this in public spaces. Um, so we've said no. We've turned over, you know, forty million dollars of funding from the venture arm of an intelligent U.S. intelligence agency um, because we just felt that was the wrong thing to do. So I, I, you know, it's. I'm so happy to hear that more and more startups are are kind of holding that high bar because I, I think that's going to be really key. Yeah, I would have three things. I think, I think first is, um, you know, in my book, I've sort of talked about the fact that you can scale with, with AI, you can get exponential scale and, you know, get lots of benefits to your users and to your companies. But the downside is that you can also exponentially scale the harm. So if you have trained an AI system to give credit score and somehow it's been trained on a biased data set or biased labeling perspective, then you would be able to scale, you would take that harm and scale it to all your consumers. And we saw a little bit of this when the Apple Card got introduced. I don't know if you remember or not, when the Apple Card got introduced for the same household, right? Women got less credit uh, than men did, right? And, and Apple and, and Goldman Sachs said, we don't have gender in our, in our data, right? And, and we're like, uh, Statistics 101, there could be like 10 other confounds that are, are perfectly correlated with gender, and that's what's going on, right? And so, so part of the thing you don't want to think about is like you can now scale the harm as much as you can scale the benefit, and it can be exponential. And I think business leaders need to think about that. The second thing is that you are breaking the law, right? So like the U.S. law says that you know, there's a bunch of things about fairness in the U.S. law, and it doesn't say fairness on average. It says fairness to the person versus machine learning algorithms and the, the work that's been done prior years has been about fair, it's fair and average, but the law says no. And so one of my colleagues, Seth Neal, has sort of said like probably about half the AI deployments right now in US organizations are probably breaking some law, right? And so I tell executives, if you don't pay attention, you might go to jail, right? Like, you know, you, the US government will come after you. So like a little bit of fear of, uh, of, of the US government and the feds uh, to them. Third bit, which I think is the most positive bit, is that it connects to what Jim just said is that 
we're seeing a change in practice. So people are getting aware of these issues and they're changing how they are actually doing the development of these systems. And just as, you know, if you remember 10, 15 years ago with Microsoft, like the, the security situation with, with Microsoft was really bad, lots of malware, was buggy code that was insecure. And Microsoft had to sort of retrain their programmers to build secure code from day one instead of after the fact. Today, most AI systems are such that we find discrimination after the fact and then we freak out. What you have to do is change your practice in terms of making sure these diverse people are there, that you actually account for the law, you account for understanding why the systems might be biased and fixing it up front. And I think that it's a positive sign that in startups, uh, you would not expect startups to invest in Even that. Even startups. Yeah, which is, which is really cool that startups are investing in that, but large companies are seeing that, but the fact yeah. that the startups are yeah. investing in it, so it tells me there's a change. Yeah, I, I mean, there were startups of only 10 people, Yeah, and they had, they were That's making awesome. a significant effort, uh, which is, I think, pretty impressive. Yeah. Can I um, uh, make a plug for the AI exhibit at the Museum of Science? Because there's actually a part uh, where it talks about bias and how we should be cognizant of, which is amazing, right? Because we're going to see like many, many, many young people go through the exhibit and hopefully we'll, we're planting the seed early so that everybody can think about this. A final question. I'm just going to go rapid fire, which is working in this space, thinking about this uh, and AI and jobs, What's one thing that you feel like you can see about what, what the world is going to look like in five or 10 years that maybe the average person who does not think about this very much uh, can't see? Uh-oh, I've stumped them. Uh, sorry. <laughs> okay, good night. <laughs> I, I, I'll go first. Um, I am just super excited about the whole like digital health and digital biomarkers. Um, I think we're seeing incredible kind of biosensing technologies. And once we are able to pull all of this data together, um, I do think it will enable precision medicine and personalized medicine in really amazing ways. So I'm, I'm excited about that. So like easier diagnosis of things or seeing that, oh, there's a, the way that you're breathing, there's a problem like. Yeah, your facial little, vocal biomarkers, uh -huh. physiological sensors, even my, your microbiome and your gut biome. Right. Um, all of this data is all going to come together and it will allow us to understand health in, in, in a very different way. Okay. Yeah, I, I would, you know, the 84% the of people that said that they're using AI today is probably because of you sort of get it like from your phone, from your personal consumer lives using AI. What I expect is that in a decade's time that our work lives will be augmented to some degree by AI. And it'll be happening in subtle ways. Again, like if I look at programmers and they're at the bleeding edge, or now artists and they're at the bleeding edge, right? Like, like people are figuring out how can this augment me? And I think the consequences are kind of interesting because again, it may end up sort of giving average people several standard deviations of performance, right? That they may not be used to before. And that may have some pretty interesting, cool implications for productivity. So as, as you know, Jim, as an economist and historian, like you sort of say like, wow, if now we get all this machine generated code as we're writing software and that the, 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 the average productivity of a software developer increases because now you have this AI augmentation, it has some, if it becomes true, it's going to be so sort of profound, right? And so I think both in art and in, in, in programming is at the bleeding edge of this augmentation, but I expect that other professions will also get the doses of augmentation. And what's interesting is that, and this is where the startup scene is so interesting, is that people are deploying this in, like, in agriculture, right? In healthcare, like every sector, there is a startup or companies trying to figure it out and make it happen. Today, there's a paper in Nature uh, with DeepMind and a bunch of people from uh, a couple of universities where they showed that they could use now use basically rudimentary machine learning to help mathematicians develop new theorems that were de novo to the world. And, oh, so like now high-end math people, Boffins and Cambridge University and at MIT and at Harvard are now going to use AI to now rethink theorems or develop new theorems. That's kind of exciting and cool. So I'll just say that five years is nothing. I don't want to make the same mistake Jeff Hinton made, predicting <laughs> something five years from now. But I, I, the other thing is, I, I think with most technology, it's it's unpredictable. We're gonna we're gonna see a lot of changes. But I, I think it's, and I, I I I'm not disagreeing that these are some potentially yes. possible areas. But 
in any particular time frame, I think it's very hard to know what's what's going to come up. And almost certainly, that's a good sober answer. <laughs> we're going we're, we're gonna to be surprised. We're yes. going gonna, to we just don't, we're going to be surprised. Thank you to Jim Besson, to Rena Okalubi, to Kareem Makani. Just a round of applause for an amazing panel. Got, they all have books. Um, and if you want to know more about their books, there are QR codes there. Feel free to eat and drink um, and check out the exhibit. And thanks to everybody both here and online for watching. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.